everybody and welcome to another exciting edition of words images and worlds i'm delighted to be joined on this episode by a person who's done a good bit of work in the podcasting world but also 30 years 30 plus 30 years plus. 30 plus in comics and that is barbara kelberg barbara may i call you barbara is that okay yep barb i answer to hey barb. you as well all right all right i answer to a variety of things also, so um, thanks for joining us. I say us, meaning me and anybody else out there that's listening. And I always like to ask a question, some variation of a question to start out with, which you and I have already sort of embarked on, which is your journey to writing, creating, and the written word. How did that, how did that start for you? I've always been a reader from the age of five, a voracious reader. Uh, you could always find me at school instead of uh, doing whatever at lunchtime, I would sit by my locker and read. Uh, when I was a teenager, I worked in a Rexall drugstore. And back then they had spinner racks of comics. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. One of my jobs as a clerk in uh, Rexall's was to take out the old comics and rip off the covers, which I know a lot of comics fans go, oh, no, that's uh -huh. horrible. But the owner of the company or the Rexalls would take those covers and get credit for his next purchase because he hadn't sold them. And then I was supposed to take the bodies of the comics and toss them in the trash. Well, the trash happened to be my, my trunk of my car. So uh -huh. that really got me into reading comics as a teenager. And, uh, I was fascinated by a DC comic book called Warlord and the hero was Travis Morgan. And huh. all he basically wore was a helmet and a, and a skull cod piece. I mean, what 14 year old girls are going to want to, you know, watch something with a, read something with a, a, a hunky guy and a, and a skull cod piece. Uh -huh. uh, you know, girls can be just as shallow as men <clears throat> and so can women. So after uh, I graduated high school, I went on to college and I kind of got out of comics and back into completely uh, deep literary books. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't until after I married and had children and I was stuck at home all day with kids that I started to go a little nuts. You know, I, I just needed something besides listening to a two and a four year old uh, all day long. And one day I was in Walden Books and I ran across a graphic novel called Elf Quest. And it was all uphill from there. Uphill because I don't want to say downhill because it very definitely uh, turned into a passion and my passion turned into a career. So I was one of the, uh, the lucky ones who had some artistic talent and fell in love with the craft and pursued it and made it into a career. Uh, I started, and this is a whole different story. I started with Malibu Comics, uh, one of their satellite lines, Adventure and Eternity uh, in 1989. And Chris Alm, I believe was the one that, that hired me. He, he wanted me to do ink washes. He goes, do you, know how to, do you know how to do gray washes? And I lied through my teeth and said, oh yeah, of course. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> No idea what that was, uh, but I came home, I read up, there you go again, I, I read, went to the library, checked out all the books I could on it, and did it. Uh, I had actually been angling for an inking job because I was very good with a brush. Uh, I was an amateur painter. But I finished the, the assignment over two books, two or three books, and uh, they said, do you think you'd like to ink Planet of the Apes? I'm like, uh, yeah. And that's really where it began. I did 11 issues of Planet of the Apes. And from there, I jumped over to um, Malibu's Ultraverse line uh, and uh -huh. inked a whole slew of books for them, including every issue of Solitaire. One and, of my favorites. Uh, yeah. Yes, over Jeff Johnson. His pencils are just to die for. And uh, I stayed with Malibu, but I also branched out to Innovation Now Warp Graphics, I, I actually did work for uh, the people who got me into it, which was ElfQuest, uh, DC, Marvel, and a whole slew of other people. 
So um, it just opened up a whole new world for me. I was able to stay home with the kids. Uh, we have come in an open plan house. So I had my studio and I could see what they were doing and um, be a stay at home mom and make money at the same time, which was the best of all worlds. And it just, I just loved it. So it's been a, a wonderful, wonderful career for me. And, and even at this late stage in my life, um, I'm still going strong more than ever. Yeah, that's, uh, we can we can talk about the things you're working on now if you want and the things that are next, or we can sort of save that question as the, well, I can go, the I can last piece. Yeah, talk yeah, about it now. Um, I kind of stepped away from comics for uh, several years. Not so much stepped away as just really damped down on it and only took you know a job here and there uh, because the economy and other things going on in my, on my life uh, had to keep a roof over our head, such and such. But around eight years ago, uh, we paid the house off and I told my husband, you know what, I'm going to go down to part-time and I am going to jump back into comics. He's like, okay, go ahead. So it wasn't that easy. It didn't just like, oh, I'll just jump back in. I hadn't really done uh, a lot of serious work for several years. And if you're, as with anything in the entertainment industry, you're only as good as your last project. Well, there's a whole new crop of artists that have come in since since I'd been through. Uh, even though I, I worked for almost a dozen years for DC, two or more books a month. It was still it was start, still really tough to break back in because uh, I was an unknown again, and I was also up there in years, so it was it became very difficult. Uh, then about four years ago, an old editor from Malibu, and an, another artist from Malibu that I'd worked with, uh, uh, Roland Mann was the editor, and uh, he called me and said. I have a book and Dean Zachary is penciling it. And Dean and I had worked together many times before and we were really good together because um, I'm resurrecting my book from the nineties, cat and mouse. Do you want to, do you want to do it? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. You guys are like the dream team for me. So we started cat and mouse. We kickstarted it and it was a big success. And he's like, you know what? Let's just start our own company. So Roland had done this once or twice before and hadn't had much luck with it. Um, he'd had Silverline 1.0, Silverline 2.0, and then we started Silverline 3.0. But this time he said, it's it, it's got to be different this time because the last few times I did it, I was trying to do all the work myself and, and, and I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. He goes, um, this time I need help. So we're going to spread the work out amongst uh, a few people that don't want to come in. He goes, do you have any other skills besides inking? And I said, well, I've spent 20 years as a corporate accountant. Great. You're our CFO. <laughs> and uh, so that's how I kind of how I got into Silverline. That's the company that I'm part of. And his wife is a CEO. And he's the head cook and bottle washer. And we have other people to kick in their talents as well. So that's been uh, my life for the last four years. And uh, after we got up and rolling, I said, um, you know, there's been something I've wanted to do for a very long time. I just turned 60. And I said, if I'm ever going to write my own book, I better get, do get it done. Because if not now, when? And he said, yeah, sure. Submit a proposal. So... I wrote, I wrote a script called divinity mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, turned it in and he goes, this is, this is amazing. I said, okay, but I'm going to need help on this. I can write, I can write till the cows come home. I'm actually a pretty good writer, literarily. Scripting, however, is a whole different animal. It's, it takes a different type of skill to script a comic book, cinematography wise, uh, language wise you, where to place the word balloons trying to squeeze a, a story 
into sequential art form, mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. needed help. So Ari hooked me up with another old friend from way back when, R.A. Jones. So we collaborate. Um, the story's mine, the character's mine, the plot lines are mine, the outlines are mine. I give it to him. He scripts it. He sends it back. I go through it and mark it all up and I send it back to him. He sends it back to me. We go back like this until it, we come to an agreement that it's it's perfect. And then it goes to art. And uh, I've, I'm currently in the process of working on issue number four and it has been a very, very good seller for me. I'm so happy with it. Uh, it won the best new graphic novel of 2020 or graphic novel, best new comic series, I'm sorry, of 2020. So it's not a bad way to start. Not at all. Not at all. No. And I learned how to do digital art after I turned 60. Um, I now do digitally ink and I taught myself the color. So no, don't let anybody ever tell you that you're too old to do something. Because not only did I write my own book, but I taught myself digital art, which I'd never touched the digital art in my life and digital coloring. Um, and it's, I'm having a blast. I'm having the time of my life. It's awesome. That is so awesome. And what a great addition to an already, uh, I mean, stellar career from, I mean, you've done so much. Uh, you mentioned all of these publishers that anyone in the world of comics knows and loves. Uh, and I mean, I think you've done everything from the mask to, um, I think there was a, was there a Married with Children comic? Yes, somewhere in, that was yeah. now comics, Married with Children. Uh -huh. I have done Lost in Space for Innovation, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. For DC, I spent two and a half years on Impulse, which was uh -huh. absolutely uh -huh. a blast. Um, Hawkman was I did, DC. Yeah, every issue of Primal Force. I did some Green Lantern some Wonder Woman. I don't know. I, it, there's so many of them. I've done well over 200 books in my in my career so far. For Marvel, I did a little She-Hulk, a little Gargoyles, and a whole lot of Barbies. Yes, Back then, yeah. there was a bit of a glass ceiling, and most of the women got stuck on Barbie, but uh, it's come a long way since then. I, I was going to mention that you're one of the um, longstanding female creators in the medium in a very male dominated profession. I've had Nancy Collins come on and talk as well. So huge uh, respect that way. Also. Oh, thank you. There mm -hmm. isn't a, a lot of women anchors that have spent a long time back then anyway, uh, spent a long time on superhero books for DC and Marvel. So I, that I was kicking some glass ceilings, but there it's so much more open now, but um, this is one of my favorite stories that I like to tell. The first time I went to New York, uh, took my portfolio to DC Comics, and I'm not going to name names, I'm not like that, uh, went to an editor at DC, and he looked through my portfolio and he goes, wow, this, this is really good. You're, you're, you're really good at this. You ink like a man. <laughs> I've never figured that out. I huh. never figured out what exactly he meant, but that's that's kind of the the thinking back then. Yeah, yeah, that that's the limited perspective. <laughs> Absolutely, Malibu wow. didn't care as long as I met deadlines. They give me all the work I wanted. Same with DC. Oh yeah, yeah, and I I love the Malibu stuff. I love Nightman, and again, Solitaire was was absolutely one of my favorites. I think just the look and style of that character. Oh, Jeff uh, was so fun to work with. When I uh, started Divinity, my book Divinity, I asked him if he would contribute a cover and he was ecstatic to work with me again. Oh yeah, absolutely. And he, I haven't worked with you forever. Let's do this. And the cover is just magnificent. Actually, it's my the favorite color that's a uh, cover that sells the most. Uh, so uh, it was great to work with him again after like 30 years. Uh, I was going to ask about um, the span of what you've done and the some of those best collaborations and best experiences and best titles. So it sounds like you've had quite a few. Yeah, I'd have to say RA, artistically, RA is, is my favorite collaboration right now because this is my baby. 
-hmm. you know, so divinity has my heart and he's helping me to script that, uh, professionally, business-wise, my, just being a part of the Silverline comic, uh, comics, uh, in, uh, the whole company has been an amazing collaboration because I've never had so much say in how the comics are made and how businesses run. So it's been an interesting perspective from the business side of comics. Um, obviously, as, as a CFO, I see where the money's going. So it's amazing what people don't think about, especially if they're running a Kickstarter. Um, what they don't think about, you have to pay for. All the little, the little details that nickel and dime a person running a Kickstarter to death. If you don't think about this stuff ahead of time, you're going to be in big trouble. And it's amazing what all goes into actually producing, kickstarting, and mailing out books to people. It's not, it's not just say, hey, back my book, collect the money. No, that that's not where that's where it starts. In the comics process itself, I think people underestimate the complexity of that and the multiple hands that go into it and layers in the process. It's gotten easier because of the digital press. Uh, it's a lot easier than it was um, back when in the 90s, even uh, then comics uh, was just starting to go into the computer colored uh, phase. But before that, <clears throat> excuse me, before that, uh, if you wanted like um, a color hold on lines, you had to do them in red on a, on a separate sheet uh, or red pen so that they could block that out in a whole different, in a hand done process. It was a whole different thing. And it was a very much of an assembly line process. It went from the writer back to the editor, from the editor to the penciler, the penciler back to the editor, um, unless they were in a hurry or behind schedule. And then from the editor in to the anchor, then to the letterer, then to the colorist. But that was the only way to do it back then because if you were going to turn out one book a month, it had to be an assembly line process. One person could not do it all. Um, things have sped up considerably, especially with digital. Um, but it's still, it's almost too much for one person to do a book a month. Book every quarter, maybe. But you still need to have people help you if you're going to turn out consistently. Um, I usually, as I mentioned, the, one of the last questions I usually hold is um, what's next or what's happening, but we've kind of talked about that. So I also like to ask what the comics medium has done for you and what it's opened up for you as a storyteller um, to sort of dovetail back to that question of what got you on this path. Um, what are the possibilities and, and what do you maybe even see next in the world of comics? I believe that independent comics are the future of comics. I think the days of, and not to say that I don't love DC and Marvel. I do. I really do. I collect DC and Marvel. Um, I work for them and they've been very, very good to me. But I don't think they're, the way they do business is going to last much longer. They are caught in a, corporate grinding wheel you know it's they have to answer to a lot more people than just the editors they have to answer to their board and they have to answer to the stockholders and in some ways that really limits them uh. and you can't you can only tell an origin story so many times before people are just going to be so turned off they're going to say again now nah, forget it um and their storytelling has to be it can't be too edgy because then they have a tendency to lose sales i think i think independent comics are so fresh and so different and there's so many good stories coming out of independent companies i i think that's where the, the future is and if we can even approach 
the model that um, Japanese anime does, yeah, we would we would be in such a better place. They have got it down, but the thing is, they've had it in their culture for generations, mm-hmm. and for them, their culture, it's no big deal. You pick them up on the on the grocery store stands next to the checkout counter, yeah. you know. They were raised on anime, whereas the American public still has this view that comics is either for kids or for nerds. They need to know that comics can be mainstream. I mean, Mouse is a Pulitzer Prize winning graphic novel. How many comics do you see that uh, are Pulitzer Prize winning novels? You know, that's very, it's very um, brilliantly written. Anybody mm-hmm. could read that and, and not think that they're reading a comic book, you know, yeah. and it is mm-hmm. becoming more acceptable to read graphic novels because they don't have the word, the connotation of comics on them. But still, the American public is still not conditioned to look at comics as a legitimate source of literary knowledge. I think we need to change that, but I'm not sure how. I agree. I agree. And I used to use the words graphic novel a whole lot more. Um, And a lot of times just to push that term back to comics, because there's nothing wrong with calling a comic a comic or a long form comic or whatever you want to call it. Um, So I, I agree with you on that. And I also I love the innovation that is part of the independent publishing world and the voices that are opened up. As part yeah, of that it's too. so fresh and exciting. It's like, for me, it feels like it's the wild, wild west of comics. Uh, yeah. And I think it has become more accessible. The making of comics has become more accessible with uh, the internet, web mm-hmm. comics, the idea that you can do short run comics. The, the printer that we use, Kablam, they'll do one book if you want or they'll do 25 or 500, you know, the ability to print on demand has changed the entire industry. Uh-huh. Yeah, lots of, lots of wonderful things happening and hopefully ahead and um, wonderful conversation. Did, did I miss anything that you want to make sure to mention before we conclude the, the conversation? Well, I definitely want people to check out our company, Silverline Comics. You can go to silverlinecomics.com. You can get um, most of our books are, there's a link on that webpage that'll take you to Indie Planet or any of the Kickstarters that we, uh, we're doing like four Kickstarters a year. Any of the Kickstarters that we have, you can buy all the back issues of any book that we've done. And um, I'm in the process of, doing issue number four of divinity and that will not be the end great so i've got the whole next arc figured out glad to hear it glad to hear it um and i'll link the website in the description of the podcast for folks that want to check that out and thank you for the the amazing work that you've done the the breadth the depth and thanks for taking some time to talk with me about it Oh, you're welcome. If anybody wants to follow me on my socials, I'm the only Barbara Kielberg on the internet. Not hard to find me, especially on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. So look me up. I would be more than happy to connect with people. I'm a big believer in, uh, in th- we're all in this together. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And, um, Hopefully we'll we'll have you back on at some point to talk about the next phase in Silverline and uh, where Divinity has gone and all of those things. Thank you. I appreciate being here. My pleasure. And and thanks again.